Hello, I'm Cheney Mullins, and I'm a summer intern with the Loose Policy Institute and a student at the University of Virginia. I have the pleasure today of introducing Mary Catherine Ham. Mary Catherine graduated from the University of Georgia with a degree in journalism and worked in sports journalism before getting involved in the conservative movement as a writer and commentator. She worked at the Heritage Foundation and has written for such prominent publications as the Washington Examiner, the Daily Caller, and the Weekly Standard, and has also been featured on townhall.com. Mary Catherine Ham is known for her success as an unarticulate radio talk show personnel because until March of 2012, she was a co-host of The Morning Majority, which ran weekdays in Washington, D.C. She is also a frequent Fox News contributor and analyst, appearing often on Red Eye and also with Ron Williams on The O'Reilly Factor. Mary Catherine ran a very successful video blog known as Ham Nation, which won a Golden Dot Award, and her video Sopranos DC, exposing questionable Washington transactions and secrets, won the 2007 Web Blog Video of the Year Award. Her articles and videos cover everything from education to personal stories to economics and current events. She particularly loves and focuses on conservative fiscal and security issues. Mary Catherine is now married and continues her work for our conservative movement as the editor-at-large of Hotair.com. She considers herself a true feminist and is inspired by her grandmother's legacy of doing it all without government interference. I heard her speak about this earlier this summer. She encouraged me as a young conservative woman, and I was impressed with how persuasively she spoke. She was very witty and friendly, and is an amazing example of intelligence and success. Please join me in welcoming Mary Catherine Hamm.
it really <laughs> doesn't help their perspective. Um, presumably, we were all normal at some point as well, before we got into all this, and we still have that inside of us, and I think we should cultivate it. Uh, I'm from North Carolina, I try to get down there every now and then to check in. Uh, just being outside the Beltway can be helpful for this. And most importantly, it makes whatever you're fighting for up here easier to get. Because if you're able to communicate with the people who are not following this every day and get them to change their minds, that's when you start achieving things here. Because that's the ultimate power, is having normal people on your side, not the people who read Soap Opera's Digest every week. So I would encourage you to stay in touch with your normal person. Somewhere deep inside you, it exists. <laughs> um, second, uh, when you're going back to explain Washington, one of the things that I've thought since I moved here is that our duty, and this comes with uh, communicating with normal people, is to learn Washington, learn the things that are wrong with it, and inform people that this is how things really happen here. I remember when I came to Washington for the first time, I didn't know this. I was young. I had been like covering NASCAR, um, which is basically watching a bunch of dudes turn left perpetually, so it's just like Congress. But, <laughs> but I didn't really know that much myself. I was a, sort of a weirdo. I had been into politics from a young age, um, certainly had an ideology fairly young. But the on-the-ground reality, I didn't understand. I got here, and the, one of the first things I learned was that they don't read the bills. And I was like, that, that can't be right. Is that right? And I felt compelled to research it further because I couldn't believe it when people told me. And then I found out, of course, not only is that the truth, but it's standard practice. It's not even thought of as odd in Washington. So I took that message back home said, hey, did you guys know that they don't even read the bills? This was years before the whole healthcare thing, when that became very, became very hip to read bills uh, around that time. <laughs> I, was, I was like the hipster of reading bills. I was into it so early. Um, so I took it back to my friends back home and said, look, they really don't read the bills. Don't you think there's something wrong with that? Even if you're someone who loves the federal government and thinks they can do no wrong, it should just be gigantic and serve everyone's needs. Don't you think they should actually do some due diligence on every single bill they pass? And even my liberal friends back home were like, yeah, that's not right, is it? And they thought I was propaganda. I actually was not, which they learned, you know, in the past couple of years. But I think in the past couple of years, with the healthcare debate, I think that that on its own, regardless of where you stand on that issue, was a great educational moment for the entire country about exactly how this town works. Because what happened is that they wanted to pass it in two months. The public said, whoa, 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 hold on. And what would have happened in two months, all the back scratching, all the backroom deals, all of the not aired on C-SPAN hearings they had about it, discussions and negotiations they had about it, that stretched out for a year. And then once it stretched out that long and you could see all the details, it's really, really ugly. What Americans learned is like, that's not new. That's the way that most bills get done. You just saw it all out in the open for the first time. And that's a powerful thing, and something that I think the normal people need to know. So I'm glad we went through it. Um, so it's your, it's your chance to learn here the weird things that people don't know about Washington, communicate it to them. Uh, just the other day I was reading Ezra Klein about the horrible unproductivity of this Congress. Um, and he stated valiantly how in the Clinton years, Congress had gotten 333 bills done. Well, from my point of view, and I think sensibly from any of our points of view, the number of bills passed should not be the mark of success. Great, 333 bills. Can Ezra tell me what those did? Actually, to be fair, Ezra probably could. He's like, number one, and number two, <laughs> and number three. But, we need to be cognizant of every single one of those 30, 333 bills. Not only that, not just us weirdos, but back home, people whose lives are being affected by these 333 bills should have a chance to weigh in, should know exactly what's going on. And we have gotten so bloated and so gigantic that, that it's almost impossible for them to do that. That's why people come to me when I'm home all the time and go, 
look, it's just exhausting. I don't want to be involved in this. And I say, I know. It's, that's why we're here, to be involved partly on your behalf. But what I wish is that we could get this sucker boiled down <laughs> to small enough that you actually could be involved. And you actually could learn exactly what they're doing up here. So that's our job. We're ambassadors for this weird stuff that goes on here. And it's our job to try and fix it by convincing people it's insane. It's actually not that hard a job if you work on it. Um, as far as, what age are you guys? Are you guys college age, mostly? Being an intern, I actually was not one on Capitol Hill. I did my work elsewhere in newspapers and stuff. But uh, one thing I would say about being an intern, if you're going to take a job here, if you're going to take your first job here, and it applies to all your entry-level jobs, that kind of thing, uh, do not be above doing the silly stuff they ask you to do. This is, I know we're getting very practical here. I'm just bringing it down. But I've had experiences where, I'll just give you my first job in Washington as an example. I had a job that, in its job description, there was nothing about going to a particular meeting on Capitol Hill, taking notes about that meeting, and writing it up every week. It wasn't the greatest treat in the world. It wasn't in my job description. I could have possibly put up a fuss about it. But I wrote the notes every week, and somebody at my workplace saw the writing and said, hey, we kind of like the way you write. Would you like to write a column for us? So that was a big turning point for me, and I think it did teach me, like, look, don't sort of dismiss things that you might think, hmm, is that really in my job description, boss, or is this, doesn't mean you have to take abuse. Make, but making yourself available and making sure that you're willing to do some of that stuff, because frankly, when you're young, a lot of the people above you, it takes a lot of money per hour to get them to take notes at a meeting, right? I was way cheaper. <laughs> and so that was a good investment for the company. And not making a fuss about that ended up paying off really, really well for me. Uh, another thought on basic sort of career advice. This town is about who you know. That does not always have to be a nasty thing. I remember when I got here, it was sort of like, I'll make it on my own. I don't need to know any people, right? <laughs> and it's true, you can make it on your merit, but there's something I had not realized as a young person that, like, that's just how human relationships work. But I will say this about making connections. In Washington, we have a bunch of happy hours and whatnot, and specifically meetings for connecting with other people who might help you in your career. Your connections will be way more helpful to you if you actually have a connection with them. So the happy hours are fun, the connecting events are fun, but if you only go in there all mercenary style to find somebody who's going to give you a leg up, ironically, that's not going to help you as much. If you go in and, I know it sounds silly, but if you just like be a nice person like your mom advised, it's really helpful. <laughs> so that's another one. Uh, do not be afraid to try weird things on the job. And that's not kinky. Don't, get, don't look at me like that. <laughs> Do um, <laughs> not be afraid to try to think. There is, being young has an advantage. For instance, did you ever think that running a Facebook page could be a marketable skill? It is, because older people, frankly, just don't innately understand these things as much as you guys do. So you have an advantage in the marketplace right now that you should use. When I was coming up, uh, just a couple years ago, like, Twitter and YouTube and all these things were brand new, the costs of embarrassing oneself were rather low. The people were just learning it, they weren't sure exactly what to do with it, so I decided to do a Weekend Peeps newscast where I dressed up Peeps to illustrate the news of the week. This is a very silly idea. It got hundreds of thousands of views. Um, so having the ability to think a little bit weird. I hate the term outside the box because it's so not outside the box. Meta. But um, <laughs> having the ability to do that, especially with new technologies, is what's going to make you stand out. And there are going to be a thousand new tools coming up that Congress people need, that activist organizations need, that you will probably be familiar with months before your bosses. So keep an eye on that. 
uh, in general, keep your head about you. It's like people who mess up on Twitter are generally just being jerks. If you act like a nice, normal person, then you're generally okay. Uh, but don't be afraid to try out those new tools. Um, and then, oh, this is one I always give to. Again, very practical, but I swear. I especially give this to young women coming into politics. And some of you who've heard me speak before may have heard it because it's my hobby horse. Get yourself a negotiating coach. I know that the Congress, in all its wisdom, was going to pass a bill that would make sure that no woman would ever be paid less than any other man ever or something. Just like they did two years ago when they passed the Lily Live Better Act, which was supposed to do the same thing. I think it's all nonsense. If you are getting paid $5,000 less than a male counterpart, if that's the case, uh, then you need to be asking for $15,000 more. And the best way to solve that problem is to get yourself a negotiating coach, go in there and ask for what you need, what you deserve, and don't go to the Speaker of the House and say, hey, could you pass the bill that would help me earn $5,000 more a year? That's a, it's really cost-benefit analysis, really bad way of going about doing that. Um, it goes for men as well, but in particular, women, I think, have more problems in that situation, asking for money, pushing back, and if you get a coach who will hit your helmet before the game, get you ready to go, in the end, if you start early in your career, it will pay dividends throughout your career. It's a really simple thing. I did it years ago. I have a friend who's like a real, she does negotiations every single day. And every time I'm up for a job, we do the pep talk. She's like, what are you going to ask for? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it works. And uh, it's a favor that I have done myself and that I just encourage everybody else to give a, to give a try. Uh, it can just be a friend. It doesn't have to be a class. Uh, but it will help you. And it's your right, even as a young person, to go into a room and they offer you and you say, First of all, I will add the caveat, maybe not on your first job, but like as you're moving up through the ranks, to go in there and say, look, push back a little bit. I have these certain skills. I have these things that make me different and special. I have proven that I'm good at this. This is what I want. So, just put that out there. And then the last thing I will say, and I do, I do want to do Q&A. I know the speaker was uh, doing photos and I don't want to like hold you guys over too long. Um, but the last thing I wanted to say is, as conservatives, I think a lot of times we get a little cowed into not thinking that what we do is just as noble as what people are doing on the other side. And I see it all the time. I think the, the Tea Party was actually sort of a moment for conservatives to go, hey, yeah, like what I, what I do matters, and the things I care about are righteous and like, the things that I want to do and making government smaller and making it more simple are good things. I'm going to embrace that and I'm going to go stand out in the park and I'm not going to let these people tell me I'm a racist, horrible person because of it. Uh, it can be easy, especially in a very liberal environment, to let people cow you. But do not be afraid to think that what you are doing and believe what you are doing is noble. You are trying to make this government smaller and more responsive to the American people, smaller and more responsive to the democratic process. What exactly is not noble about that? It's a beautiful thing. Look at it from the point of view of you wanting to actually have people with input on those 333 bills, preferably less, that come through Congress every year. It's a wonderful thing. And people will tell you all the time that you're a heartless, horrible person because you want to do it. And they're wrong. And just own it because that will actually make you a better communicator as well. Um, those are my sort of basic tips. I would love to do Q&A just because I like Q&A on current events or advice or what have you. Is that cool with you guys? All right. <laughs> I'll start, I guess. I'm Jane Mullins. And I was just wondering if you could expand on this concept of being a passionate conservative, especially as a young person, and attracting other people to be passionate 
conservatives that combine mind and heart and then share that the message is really compassionate for other people? Yeah, I think um, A, knowing your stuff is important. Um, I grew up with all liberals. I went to college with mostly liberals. I moved to Washington. I, there was a brief stint where I was in a small town in North Carolina where I was like not completely outnumbered. Um, but as a result, I had to learn my stuff. I had to get ready, um, not necessarily to go toe to toe in a sort of cable news style debate. That's not going to win people over, like if you're out having a beer. But in a way that I could say, look, I and mean, one of the ways that I've found most uh, persuasive, particularly with somebody who's already a liberal or somebody who's a swing voter who just has this idea that, like, aren't you just out to get people? Is to honestly say calmly, look. Um, People, honest people, good people, believe something different, and here's why. And let me explain how it benefits normal folks, how it is a compassionate point of view, and I think taking that approach, specifically among small groups of friends, uh, is probably the best way to reach people. And a lot of times, like, like I say, especially when I talk to young women or talk about women voters, um, and it goes for young people as well, uh, you don't have to necessarily swing them all the way to committed conservative with you. What you want to do is hone in on some issues that they agree with you. You start chipping away at that conventional wisdom. If they start agreeing with you on one issue, then they're going to come with you some of the rest of the way later. I have a great, my best friend uh, from home who uh, is now with the uh, Commerce Department. She believes in free trade. That was her that was the Achilles heel with her. No, so she, but she's not a, she's not a, you know, an activist conservative. But she is not in the same place she was before because she had this different point of view on that. Um, and so I think tapping into that and not being like, why don't you agree with me on every single issue ever? That's not going to help you as much. Because with young people, especially with our peers, it's just not going to happen that often. So I like to play it soft. But when they attack you, feel free to come back. <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming in to speak with us sure. today. My name is Pamela Meyer Hofer. I go to Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. You mentioned that during one of your first positions, you had to go to those meetings and take notes, and it right. became kind of a game changer for you. Right. What would be your advice? I mean, that kind of altered your career path a little bit. When did you figure out, or have you figured out, what you want to do in the long run? And what would be your advice to college students and interns who are still figuring it out? Um, I like having you figured it out because that is totally where I am. Um, I didn't plan to do any of this, which is, I think, actually part of why I ended up where I am, and I'm excited about it. I love where I am, but if I had, if you had asked me when I was in college or just getting out uh, what I wanted to do, this would not have been even in the realm of possibility. Not because I didn't want to do it, but it just, it would never have occurred to me to, like, do radio or TV. I had always been a writer, um, and then I found out that I liked it. I think being open to those possibilities uh, was one of the things that helped like, so somebody, because I didn't have a specific path, somebody comes and says, hey, do you want to try hosting a radio show? I'm like, oh, well, I'll try that. I'll try TV. When I got asked the first time, like, sure, I might crash and burn, but I'll try TV. And so giving those things a shot and not being afraid to do that helped. Um, and that goes along with what I was saying about being a young person, having these new marketable skills and technology, and not being afraid to embrace that and say, like, you know, maybe you're hosting, oops, excuse me, um, maybe you're hosting a web show for whatever group you're working for. Maybe you're handling the Twitter feed, but don't be afraid to try those new things, take those new tools in different directions. And I think that's what served me well. I happened to come up in a time where all of a sudden, being a commentator was sort of a job in itself, like being a personality of sorts and having a specific point of view and making it a little more fun was something that happened to serve me well with the, the time that I came up in. It wouldn't have served me well a couple of years ago. Um, but I think that the opportunities are, are multiplying as opposed to contracting as far as different things that you can do. And as far as the economy goes, I do not envy you guys going out there right now. So I want to stipulate that like my situation was different because things were, were looking pretty good. But I think in activism, there's lots of places to look on the state level, on the federal level, and so you do have some outlets, but don't be afraid to like, don't be like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be a, you know, whatever it is in the senator's office, and not veer from that. I think there's plenty of opportunities to do other stuff, and you might miss out on cool things. Hi, 
and if you are a conservative, it's just a really, it's a blast to read her. Um, and I know everybody says Atlas Shrugged. I would say there's a, there's a book called We the Living that she did that's semi-autobiographical about her growing up in the Soviet Union, um, which is really sort of a raw picture of how bad that ideology can get. Uh, and so I kind of always liked that one. It's a little bit more soft than your normal anyway, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I love economists, so I'm, that's the one thing if I had to go back to school, if someone made me go back to school, uh, I, would, I would probably go back for economics. So I love like the, the more simply written things like Bastiat stuff and, uh, and Hayek's uh, Road to Serfdom. So I like that kind of stuff, just because it, it gets you ready to do battle when you have to. Um, but I also like just silly books as well. <laughs> and don't be afraid to read those too, because that's the one thing. Taking a vacation from this intellectually and physically occasionally is really good for you. My name's Catherine. Let me ask you, um, where do you get your news? What are the top sources of news for you? And what recommendations do you have for students? To where should they go to get really good news? Um, I actually, I will say the way I get news is, um, I use my Twitter account to get almost all the news I get. I think for many people, um, especially young people, that's a cool way to do it. I find that because I use my Twitter stream, so I, I set up a very specific group of people that I follow for breaking news, and it's you know built over several years, and it's, it's probably really large at this point. But the point being, I find that I'm a good 20, 25 minutes ahead of people on breaking news because I'm on Twitter. Now I always follow that up and check with other sources. I don't just take it from Twitter, but that is my favorite way to follow news. And I remember it feels the same as the as the shift when I was in newspapers. I was the only person reading blogs in the newsroom, and I felt like I was ahead of everyone there. And then now we have Twitter, which I think can serve the same purpose. So you should always remember that it can be fast and wrong. So you need to check. But it is if you're a news junkie. That is my favorite thing to do. And then I also, of course, I love uh, Wall Street Journal, Fox News, obviously. I like to watch my own clips. <laughs> <laughs> Fox News and Hotair.com, I must give a plug to because I work there now, but it really is a great, a great blog. And again, all the economists, guys at the George Mason University economists uh, have, their own, have their own blog. Megan McCardle, I will, um, I will recommend. Uh, she's a really, really smart libertarian woman who works at Newsweek now. Uh, I love reading her. Just And aside from news, I just really like reading that more analytical, wonky stuff. So I enjoy, enjoy the economists and that kind of thing. Oh, and I do want to, since we're on C-SPAN, I would like to give a shout out to the C-SPAN Video Library, which is possibly the coolest, nerdiest website on the planet, and all of you guys will love it. You can go back to like 2000 and watch old Mitt Romney debates. What could be better? <laughs> uh, no, <it's, laughs> it is a really cool, useful tool, and if you guys are going to be working in politics and activism, great tool to have at your disposal. I use it all the time. 